I'd like to thank you all for coming out on a Friday afternoon. Uh, fortunately, I'm not the speaker today because I don't think my voice would last more than about 10 minutes. Uh, a really uh, topical discussion today on where do you catch that fish. Um, we often have a mental image of northeastern BC as sort of a, a wilderness and sort of um, a landscape that is, is pristine, but, but as we've seen in other presentations over the last year, if anything, the opposite is true. It's a, a landscape with a, a really rapid pace of industrial development. I'm going to ask my colleague, Annie Booth, to introduce the speaker today. Annie? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. We're very pleased to have Roland Wilson with us today, who is in his fifth term as chief of the West Moberly First Nations uh, up near Moberly Lake. Uh, I'm delighted that he's been able to uh, join us finally. Uh, I've spent years working with Roland uh, and West Moberly, and it's always been a delight. And uh, they're just people who really care about the land. Uh, I am not going to try and pronounce his, his traditional name. I'm simply going to give it its very rough uh, English translation, which is uh, keeper of the beaver people, which is to hold and honor and love. And I think this research is what they are trying to do uh, with the beaver people. So, Roland, thank you very much for coming. Okay. Is that on? Is that working? Yes. You guys hear me? <laughs> so, cross my fingers. Um, first off, I want to uh, thank the Clint Lee Tanay and the Curious County Tribal Council for allowing me to be here in Prince George and on their territory. Um, it's important that we do that and we recognize them here. Um, I also want to thank my family for coming. Half the front row here is my family. <laughs> and I'm getting choked up because it's the first time I've done this in front of them. Um, and this is about them. Well, not just them, about me too. Because they're my family and this is, this is what we do. This is how we live. Uh, the title of this is Where'd You Catch That Fish? Um, it's kind of a funny title, you know, but as you, we go through this, um, I'm hoping that I can show you that it's not all that funny about this. Um, I'm Chief of the West Mobile First Nations. We're located in northeastern BC. We're right in between, if you know where Chetwin is and Hudson's Hope, we're right in the middle of those two. Uh, our territory is the whole western boundary of Treaty 8 uh, in BC. Lots of people don't actually know where Treaty 8 is. Oh, I'm going to turn that thing off. Um, the outline, what I'm going to go through is Treaty Number 8, give you a little bit of a background of that. Industrial development, show you what's going on up there, as Annie said. Uh, um, traditional seasonal round, go through a little bit of that. The Crooked River Fish Study, why we're here talking about this right now. Alien and threatened fish, um, selenium and mining, Site C, and hopefully wrap it up. It's a little bit of a long presentation. I hope I can fly through it. I know we've got a, an hour, but there's supposed to be questions and answers. Treaty 8. How many people here know what treaty, who, where Treaty 8 is? <laughs> well, a fair amount. So that's Treaty 8. It's the largest, most comprehensive of the numbered historic treaties. Number 8, I think in a, there's 11 of them, of the numbered historic treaties. Uh, quite expansive. Goes all the way from uh, BC, the western boundary here, Northwest Territories and into Saskatchewan, all the way down, that's, that's close to Banff right there. So if you see me shooting an elk down around Banff, don't get all excited. <laughs> part of our discussion, part of our, what Treaty 8 is, is the oral promises that were made for um, enticing the First Nations to, to adhere to treaty. In 1914, um, we adhered to treaty uh, at West Mobley there. And I'll just quickly read this. Most of you can read it, but uh, our chief difficulty was the apprehension that hunting and, hunting and fishing privileges were to be curtailed. The provisions in the treaty under which ammunition and twine is meant to be furnished went far in the direction of quieting the fears of the Indians, for they admitted that it would be unreasonable to furnish the means of hunting and fishing if laws were to be enacted which would make hunting and fishing so restricted as to render it impossible to make, li make a livelihood of such pursuance. But over and above those provisions, we had to solemnly assure them that only such laws as to hunting and fishing 
as were in the interests of the Indians and were found necessary in order to protect the fish and fur-bearing animals would be made and they would be to free be uh, uh, they would be as free to hunt and fish after the treaty as they had never entered into it. We assured them that there would be no forced interference. Now this was this has been the leading cause uh, paragraph out of the oral promises in the Mekasu Creek court case and some of these big ones, the uh, uh, our court case, the West Wobbly Caribou case, um, this was one of the leading things. No forced interference. That was the oral promise. The oral promise has to be attached to the treaty. So this is part of the Constitution of Canada. This sits above, uh, up there with constitutional law. So only laws of protection and uh, uh, conservation for the animals are, and safety matters supersede our treaty rights. I'm going to show you a real quick little video. Uh, it's only about a minute long. Ooh, no, nope, hold on. Bruce? <laughs> I did this earlier already. See, I told you. <laughs> oh, click it. Right, sorry. Right. Not too high tech Indian, just a little <laughs> high tech. So this is, this is just a progress map of resource development, primarily on gas in northeastern BC. It started in the 1950s. Now there's a little bit of a glitch here and some of you probably will pick it up right away, but um, I'll point it out once it happens. Now these all, all these little dots are oil and gas leases, northeastern BC. And oil and gas lease is about uh, uh, 200 hectares by 200 hectares big. So the size of two football fields side by side. So in You may have seen this before. Blueberry River First Nations did one similar to this, and they, it was on the news and stuff. Now that purple piece right there, um, that's the peace arm of the Wilson Reservoir. It actually was, should have popped in, in in the 1970s. That's when it was created, when they flooded the Wilson Reservoir. Um, the time lapse thing got all kind of mixed up. I got to get that straightened out. But it's purple and not blue for a reason. Blue represents fresh water. The Wilson Reservoir is not fresh water. It's a stagnant pond of floating garbage. <laughs> uh, and as I work through the presentation, you'll understand why I'm saying that. It, they called it a recreational lake for years, and it's very, it's not recreational at all. You don't want to be out there swimming around. Um, it's Arctic water. It's cold. If you uh, fell in the water and you're out in the middle, you probably freeze to death before you got to shore. Did it stop? Oh, what happened? Okay. Let's move on. You got the gist of it. I mean, there's a lot of development going on up there. This is this little map represents only five watersheds around West Mobley. This is this is our direct area of influence. It doesn't it's going again. Look at it. <laughs> just going crazy. It um it only represents a small area. We'll get off of it. There we go. Um five watersheds in, in our area. And uh the amount of extraction, that's the that's the Montney shale gas play as well as conventional oil and gas up there. Uh, Fort St. John has the world's largest OSB plant, was the world's largest OSB plant, it's still quite big. Um, there's a lot of activity up there, coal mining, everything that's going on in northeastern BC that's worth doing for BC is happening in northeastern British Columbia. Mining, forestry, oil and gas, wind, we got the highest wind recording en uh, wind energy in, in Canada up there. We have geothermal, um, two, of the lar two of the main hydroelectric dams for BC are WAC Bennett and Peace Canyon. WAC Bennett is said to power one of every three lights in the province of British Columbia. 
So traditional seasonal round, a lot of people don't know what that means. Um, we hunt animals at a certain time of the year. We gather at, uh, medicines and, and our food, the natural foods out there at certain times of the year. You fish for certain things at certain time of the year. Um, primarily on this study, we go after the bull trout when they're chasing the pea moth up when the pea moth are spotting. The bull trout come in and they eat the pea moth and we catch the bull trout and we've been eating them. That's my mom there. Uh, and that's Andrew, and I don't remember who the little guy, Keegan. Andrew is uh, Wanda Miller over here. That's her son, catching fish. You know, this is part of our life. The treaty says, be as free to fish, hunt, and trap for as long as the sun shines, rivers flow, and the grass grows. Seasonal round, what I was talking about earlier. We, uh, I need to move out here a little bit. Rainbow trout, burbot, lake trout, white fish. Those are primarily fish. You catch them all year round, but you want to fish them at this time of the year because the water is more cold. The white fish are stronger, healthier at that time. Up here, the bull trout, Dolly Varden, northern pike minnow, suckers. Uh, well, northern pike minnow, northern pike. Arctic grayling. Um, their Arctic grayling are disappearing. Arctic grayling are, are a river fish, and they're in the Wilson Reservoir. The Wilson Reservoir has been transformed from a river into a big body of water that resembles a lake, and they, they're not surviving in there. They're one of our primary sources of fish. Coastal Indians, natives, First Nations, like eating salmon and stuff, well, we have our preferred fish too. The bull trout, it's bull trout, right? That are, um, there's a province-wide ban on fish and bull trout because they're disappearing as well. Bull trout and Dolly Varden are the big ones that we go after. They're high and really oily, just like salmon. There are salmon, equivalent to what salmon are for us up there. And we fish them during this time here. And we, we can fish them all year round, but primarily our camp would start up kind of in the springtime, early summer, and, and move on. We do the moose, the caribou, elk, that, like that, as well. This is us gathering at one of our fish camps on the Crooked River. And my, my family has been fishing the Crooked River for almost 100 years out there. Uh, they came from uh, the grandparents. My mom and, and my uh, aunts and uncles came from northern uh, the North Finley River where they lived up there, and they fished up there, and they came down. Sitting around a fire, talking about Site C and what, what the impacts of Site C are going to do to us, and then talking about Williston Reservoir and the impacts that are happening right now with us on, on Williston Reservoir. And an individual, I think sitting right there, Charlene, asked, well, hey, if I'm wrong, don't hit me. Hey, where do these fish come from? Because the Crooked River flows into the Parsnip River, which it makes up part of the, uh, the, the Williston Reservoir system. Do, are these fish coming from the Williston Reservoir? And if they are, doesn't that mercury issue from the Williston Reservoir apply to these fish? We didn't know. So we did a study. And this is what, what we're going to talk about. That's Casey, another one of my cousins. And when I talk to you about big fish, I mean, it's not an 80-pound salmon, but... That's pretty decent, right? A big smile on his face. Uh, but that this was this is kind of steady of how what we would do. We'd set up fish camp. We take these fish. We dry some of them. We can some of them. Those two fish probably went right on the fire, wrapped in tin foil with some onions and and butter in them and salt and pepper and probably cooked them up for dinner and we ate them. Right there. Kevin, he's sitting up front here too. Uh, that's one of his little dandy ones that he caught. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, what do we do? Like, how do we get this thing started? What do we have to do? Uh, we figured, well, it's, it's a health risk because it's mercury and it's poisonous to humans. Everybody knows what uh, Minamata, Japan, and all that whole thing that happened over there. And that's in the back of everybody's head, like, holy man, is that what's going to happen to us here? 
Uh, we had to follow Health Canada's methods because it was a Health Canada report. Um, and we applied our traditional ecological knowledge to this thing about how, what we do with the fish. The objectives was to uh, collect the fish, you know, analyze the mercury samples and determine whether or not there was a risk to human consumption to us on there. So this is kind of the bar graph. We caught somewhere around 57 fish, a little more maybe. Um, we tested some of them and uh, found this out. This is this 0, 2, you draw a, kind of a line up there. There is kind of a line there. But that's uh, the levels of consumption that you're supposed to take. Uh, you're not supposed to exceed that on, human, on a human consumption basis. Uh, there's a level 5 thing there which is commercial. Now, we're trying to understand, well, we're not just people that go out and fish on the weekends or go and, you know, recreationally fish. We actually fish, we catch these fish, we can them, we freeze them, we eat them all year round, not just once in a while. Out of all these fish, there's only about five of them that fell below the point zero two. So we figured there's somewhat 98% of what we caught was above. Now we've been told over and over by um, BC Hydro that the f mercury levels in the reservoir are supposed to be depleting. They've been trying for a number of years to raise or lift the mercury warning levels off the Wilson Reservoir. That's what we thought. Nobody ever thought anything like this, right? Our study comes back and it's like, whoa, let's not eat the fish. Let's kind of figure out what's going on here, guys. Um, yeah. So BC Hydro now is running their own studies, but they're not studying the health effects. They're trying to, con well, I'm assuming, they're trying to contradict our study saying that the mercury issue level is actually increasing and not decreasing out there. Um, we tried to work with them. We said, well, let's come together and do this, and they, they said no. We're going to do our own study out there. Um, we applied another study. At, uh, our second phase of this study was to look at the human effects of what this could be. And it didn't fit within the criteria of BC Hydro's Peace Wilson Watershed Compensation Program. These are consumption guidelines. I'm not going to go too much into these things. Um, if you guys know what they are, then good. Um, general populations, sensitive adults, childs, toddlers, these are the levels of what, how much you should be eating. Uh, help me out here, balloon 10, blue's wet, oh and dried, dried fish, right? So we would dry them. Um, you would, wouldn't think there would be a difference, but when you dry a fish, it actually, you take a whole fish, you dry it up, and it's not very much left of it, 98% of it's water. So you're actually concentrating the levels in the fish when you're doing that. We don't know what happens when you can the fish and put the fish in canning and, and save it like that. We don't know if that causes problems. So what does that mean? How much are you allowed to eat? For as, Who all grabbed the Hershey Kiss? Everybody? Did you eat it? Yeah? So... That one Hershey kiss, from what we understood, is the level of what a toddler should eat a week. That's what our treaty right has come to. A woman of childbearing age shouldn't eat any more a week than that. Two Hershey kisses a week. Or is it four? It's four, sorry. It's four, there, see. I was thinking, that's not right. <laughs> An adult of my my height and weight and stuff like that is somewhere around 15 of these things uh, every, every week. So when you think about our constitutional right to fish, that doesn't really add up to much up there.
So when you come out to our cabin, you catch one of those big fish. Everyone's excited. Wrap it up in tinfoil. Throw some bait. Uh, throw some butter in them. Some onions. Throw it on the fire. Everybody sits down. We eat a whole fish, two or three of them sometimes, right? We do that every day while we're out of camp sometimes. So we take our weekly, well, probably our yearly limit in about a three-day period and ingest all that. And the kids are eating it, and the women that may be pregnant are eating it. So the issue that we have is no one's taking this seriously. Like this, they, they've been trying to downplay this situation. Um, what you see on the right-hand side is the hunting and fishing synopsis of British Columbia. And they have this little caption in there saying mercury levels in lake trout, bull trout, Dolly Varden, in the Wilson Lakes and tributaries, and the lake trout in Pinchy Lake may be high. Normal consumption is not significant hazard to human health, but high consumption may be. What does that mean? What is, what is normal consumption? What is high consumption? If we're eating these fish on a daily basis as a source of food, is that normal consumption compared to what everybody else is eating? And this is the only warning that we've ever gotten. And we don't even get this. This is in the hunting and fishing synopsis of British Columbia. We don't read that. We don't need to read that. We can hunt and fish and trap and do all that things without having to even consider that. Our nation has never received a warning from BC or BC Hydro on the levels of mercury in the Wilson Reservoir. Still to this date, I raised this issue with them once I found out. Um, I live in Hudson's Hope, which is only 30 kilometers from my community, and drive, drive to work every morning. In Hudson's Hope, they have a daily bulletin that comes out. And uh, I got the daily bulletin one year, and there was a, a warning in the daily bulletin. And I've been trying to track it down now. Uh, for a while, but it's disappeared. They don't put it in there anymore because we started asking questions like, how come we're not getting notified? Like, nobody's telling us about this. Uh, BC Hydro ineffectively warns people about this in that level. Uh, does this apply equally to everyone? I don't think so. Which tributaries? What does that mean, tributaries? Like when, when somebody says tributaries, what does that mean to you? Anybody? Shout it out. I don't know. Creeks, rivers, lakes, streams. You know, we don't we don't read those the hunting synopsis. So we don't know this. When you're out there, I, I, I don't know how many. I fish from the shore. Right? I don't boat fish. I walk along the creeks and the rivers, and I fly fish and, and fish the little pools in the rivers. I don't know what the names of those creeks are. And I never stop to think, what does that the water that's, the fish that's in here, did it come from there? You know? So that's the Wilson system. That's Wilson Reservoir right there. So what we, in our study, we identified what, what could possibly be affected. Where the line stops doesn't mean that's where the end of the river is, or a creek, or that's where there's some kind of a waterfall, some kind of a blockage, an impasse that the fish can't get above on that. Wilson Reservoir, this is the Peace Arm, that's W.A.C. Bennett Dam, Chetwin, Mobley Lake is right in here. We're the closest nation to uh, W.A.C. Bennett and Peace Canyon Reservoirs, uh, Peace Canyon Dam, and both reservoirs up there. Just off the top of my head, that was a list of, of rivers that I could think of and creeks that I could think of up there. We haven't done an analysis to see how many are there. Uh, those are the ones that I've been around, fished in, and stuff. So one of the big things that the government says, well then, if there's an issue there, go somewhere else. Go fish over there. Just go somewhere else. Okay, well, where? Where do we go? Where can we go? As I mentioned earlier, we got mining and forestry, you know, and oil and gas. You can't just wander off in the bush anywhere you want. 
there's there's some pretty dangerous things going on out there. H2S zones. So, that's my son. That's his first fish. A little fart. Um, and that was that, that one there is even dandier. Both of them boat trout. The the one where he's smaller, um, we it got hooked so bad that we couldn't throw it back. He damaged the, the, the mouth of the fish so bad we had to keep it. Um, but got to thinking, I, I sat and listened to my mom tell me stories. Well, when she was young, growing up on the Finnick River, and they, her mom, my grandma, told her, showed her how to use the fish. They would catch the fish. They would go and find wild onions. They would go find pigweed. Fix it up, put it in the fire, cook it, feed the family. I get to teach my son how to throw these fish back. Because we can't eat them. We shouldn't be eating them. I, in good conscience, don't want to eat these fish. What's my son going to do with his kids? We get to go to the grocery store and buy fish from Atlantic salmon. I guess. Turkeys, boars, red snakes, and water. What the hell? <laughs> no one talks about this stuff. Wild turkeys. They're not indigenous to the area. People are bringing turkeys up there because they want to go hunt turkeys. They throw them, throw them out of their vehicles. Um, Eurasian boars. That's a Eurasian boar. That's a pig. You see that thing? See how big that thing is? That's a, that's a wild animal walking around in the Siberian forests. They're bringing them over here to hunt them. There's a ranch north of uh, Farrell Creek, just north of Hudson's Hope, that have these, not that big, but they, they have these animals on their ranch. One guy don't got hit by a vehicle. The RCMP came up there because they didn't know what it was, and he had to call the conservation officer because the gun he had wouldn't kill that thing. It was laying in the ditch wounded. These things are vicious. If you ever get a chance, uh, go on Google. Uh, Discovery had this documentary going on, probably still going on, called The Pig Bomb, about what's going on down in, down in south, uh, southern states. At, at six months of age, these pig, any pig can have a litter of pigs. Within six months, they're able to repopulate, re breed out there. And if you've got... You've got these things. If we're out in camp and these things are wandering around, well, d we don't know. They're very aggressive. Like pigs are, pigs are well, bears are, are related to pigs, they say. I would, I would get, say that would put the run on any bear I'd ever seen. Yeah. Pickerel. We got, they're dumping pickerel in the lakes up there. I, I, I caught a pickerel. I, never, I didn't know what a pickerel was. I caught this thing and I couldn't figure out what it was. One of my uh, my brother's wife caught a pickerel and uh, called Bruce up. Like, what the hell is this thing? When I saw this thing, I thought I got some kind of prehistoric animal, fish. It's got spines on its on its dorsal fin, and if you get pricked by these things, it, you, you, your hands fester. And it, and they got these sharp, long teeth. Like, <laughs> what? The, like, what is that? I swim in this. Like, is that in that water? But the government went up there and threw pickerel in there because people want to go spark fishing. Now this one, this bottom one, red snakes and kokanee. Kokanee aren't an Arctic fish. They introduced them up there. And they're, they're, they were primarily the species of fish that they were throwing into the Wilson Reservoir to repopulate the, Will the Wilson because all the bull trout and the Arctic grayling and everything were dying. They can't live and sustain, be, uh, repopulate in that kind of a system. So they're throwing kokanees in there, but we don't know what kokanee are. Our elders had no idea what they were. Um, when they're spawning, they get a red stripe on them. And the elders saw them in the water, and the way they were moving, they looked like snakes in the water. They thought, there were water's full of red snakes up there. Nobody asked us if we wanted kokanee up there. 
the elders don't eat them because you don't know what they are. Like they're a fish, but what kind of fish? I raised a question uh, in Hudson's Hope, and what turned into a big fight. I said uh, they were running a program called Kokani in the Classroom, learning fish ecology. And I said, uh, Kokani aren't from here. Why are you teaching the kids that live here about a fish that belongs somewhere else? Why aren't you teaching them about the fish that are here? Why aren't you looking at doing Arctic grayling? or bull trout, or Dolly Varden, fish that are in trouble here, and doing ecology of those things. So BC Hydro went back and wrote up a memo and sent the memo out and said, West Mobile is opposed to uh, Kokanee in the classroom fish ecology studies, so we're not doing it anymore. We've canceled the program up there. Lake trout program, Mobile Lake. Our nation has lived on that, on the shores of that lake for over 400 years uh, and around the area. We're under a, a fish advisory, conservation measures. During World War II, Mobley Lake and Gwillem Lake, two lakes up there, big lakes up there, were um, used for the war effort. They ran a commercial fishery up there and they overfished the lake trout and I put them in th into an endangered species category categorization under the Species at Risk Act, SARA, and there's conservation measures on them. We're not supposed to be fishing them. So this is one of the members, not our members, it's a solo member, uh, but that's my brother's wife. And she nets fish. Her family nets fish. And she caught this. Uh, the I don't know if you can see it very well. But that's the tail is down there somewhere, and that's the head of it up there. Like it's half the size of her. That's an old lake trout, and she put it back. She threw it back in the water, right? We're not, we're, we're, we all know that we, those fish are old. They're the grandfather fish of the lake, and they need to be in the lake to keep the lake um, balanced up there. Um, so she put it back. Hopefully it survived. But I've, n I've never seen a fish that big like that. <laughs> it was huge. That was just the other day that happened. Last week, I think, that she caught that thing. <coughs> so, go somewhere else. I said there's coal mines up there. I'm not going to get into this. This is selenium. Uh, I, my, my article, my uh, PowerPoint is available. You guys can look at that and argue amongst yourselves whether or not that means anything. But what is selenium? What does it do? Is that a health problem? Too much selenium, I know, can kill you. If you don't have enough selenium, you have to take selenium. I have a couple of friends that are selenium. Uh, um, what is it? They they got to take selenium to balance them out. Well, Pine River watershed, Roman coal mine, PRC coal mine, uh, Quintet, the new Quintet, Quintet loadout. Uh, Anglo-Americans go out, HD mining, uh, the decommissioned uh, quintet mine is there. That's on the Pine River watershed. Oh, no, not Pine River, sorry. The Murray watershed, Murray River. Wolverine River, got the Wolverine mine, decommissioned uh, quintet mine, sits right in the middle of the two watersheds so the runoff comes off both sides of that thing so it goes into both sides of the river. Decommissioned bull moose mine all have selenium. Now there's naturally occurring selenium in the water because there's coal seams that are exposed to um, the water. right? So there's already a naturally occurring selenium level there. But the baseline data, they're increasing those levels by when they're mining by sometimes 20%. A hundred times in some places. Sakunka, Dillon Mine, Brule Mine. Uh, one of our camp families have a camp out at a uh, hole in the wall, which is a uh, little f water flows out of the side of the hill. Um, it's the site of the uh, proposed coastal gas link pipeline. You can see that where we are located there. 
That's that's a little teepee. <coughs> Peace River. So go somewhere else and fish somewhere else. Well, you start quickly looking around and thinking, well, where else can we fish? And where do we have? The Parsnip River and the Finley River are the two main rivers that come together and they form the headwaters of the Peace River. And it's the only site on the whole Rocky Mountains that the rivers flow from the west side through to the east side. It's the Arctic, mo Arctic uh, uh, watershed up there. No other place does that happen where the waters from the west flow through to the east. It goes the other way, most of the places. Well, all the places. Um, that represents 50% of what's left of the Peace River in our area. It also represents the Mobley River and the Halfway River. Halfway is right up here and we're over here. That's the Mobley River right there that flows in. Now we have mercury issues in the Wilson Reservoir. Probably have mercury issues in the Dinosaur Reservoir. <laughs> Are we introducing mercury issues in the Mobley River? When they say where to go to fish? Well, we would go over here to fish, but all those coal mines are over there. And all those coal mines are dumping selenium in the water. So should we trade off mercury for selenium? This is the Twin Sisters, what you're looking at in the background there. Those are the spiritual mountains of the Dinosaur people. It's probably, I think, it's the only site in the, I don't know if you guys know, the, Del uh, the LRMP process that happened going on 15 years now, I guess. Uh, a part of the NDP government, they set up the land resource management plans throughout the province. This is the Dawson Creek, Fort St. John. The Twin Sisters sit in the Dawson Creek LRMP, but the Peace River straddles both the LR uh, Dawson Creek and Fort St. John LRMP. Spiritual, highly spiritual. There, are, there's codes and conducts and internal policies and how we go there and how what we're supposed to do when we're there. Um, Site C is not considered any of this kind of stuff. On that, you know, it's we talk about this is um, kind of the same effect of what happened with residential school. Residential schools were set up to drive the Indianness out of the people. Make them so that they're assimilated into non-Aboriginal culture. They didn't work very well. Uh, they wound up killing thousands of us. Uh, we think now they're trying to do the same thing by removing us from the land, or removing the land from us to uh, work on a cultural genocide. When you look at this, what do you see? This. Hey, okay. happiness. Love that. Everyone's smiling. The fish camp isn't about fishing. It's a part of it. The fish camp is about us coming together as a family. and exper experience in each other. That's my mom. Kevin caught that fish, he got out a big yell, right? My mom jumped up with her walker and ran down in the river to see what's going on, <laughs> hey? Kevin's got this big fish, prouder than old hell, right? Everyone's, wow, look at that. This is Gordy and Cindy, is, Gordy's a, a band member, Cindy's a member from another nation, uh, Takla, I believe, right? But they're on the Crooked River fishing, and they caught a fish, you know. I like to take my son out and fish. Right here. Right? Well, that's... Now, you, you, you need to under, understand, if you, if you knew... This probably doesn't mean nothing to anybody. Right? It's just a bunch of people smiling and fishing. Right? But if you knew him, you, that's, that's a little exciting to see him doing that. He's a, pr he's a pretty grumpy guy. <laughs> but, you know, my a cousin of mine, this is a, 
another cousin of mine and her son, you know, the transfer of knowledge there, the gathering. We don't have that camp anymore because of this. Anymore. What do we do? What happens to us? Where do we go? Is it all right that we just stop existing? I don't think it, that's, I don't want to stop existing. I don't want my kids to stop existing as tiny as all people. Right? That's my son again. I use my son because he's, I don't have to ask permission. <laughs> <laughs> we went out fishing on the Skunka River. And this is, this is where I started putting something together. He caught this little rainbow and he landed this uh, northern pike. Now, a northern pike's not a river fish, they're a lake fish. But we caught them in the river. And uh, I don't know if that means anything, but it's not, not normally where you would find them. So I showed him how to get the fish, prepare the fish, get it ready, take it home. We jumped in the truck, and I had to drive across the bridge and turn around. And as I drove across the bridge, there was a big pullout of where the vehicles pull aside to let them, as a one-lane bridge. And as I pulled in there, I saw this sign and it was nailed to the back side of the tree. And I thought, who would nail a sign on the back side of the tree? So I got out, walked around to see what the sign was. And, <laughs> and it says, concentration of selenium in the waters of the Blind Creek is above the capacity of uh, can Canadian drinking water. I put my glasses on. Uh, Canadian drinking water guidelines. What the hell does that mean? <laughs> Oh, should, should we eat the fish? I didn't know. I still don't know to this day. How much selenium are you allowed to eat before you get into trouble? Well, my wife won't eat anything but rainbow trout. So Dustin was pretty excited. He caught dinner. We're going home and we're going to cook this thing up. And a part of the culture for us is if you shoot a moose and it's your first moose or a deer or an elk, you take that animal, you don't keep it. You give it away. You share it. You let everybody else benefit. Same with the fish. You catch your first fish, you're supposed to put it on the fire and cook it for everybody, and everybody eats it. We went home, and I wrapped that thing up in tin foil and threw some onions, a little bit of garlic butter in there, and it cooked up, smelled really good. We put it on the table. <laughs> we just sat there. Nobody would touch it. Nobody would eat it. We threw it in the garbage. And I, ju I thought, what the hell? So the title is where did you catch that fish? If I catch a fish and I give it to somebody, now they, si they ask, where'd that fish come from? Where'd you catch that? Did you catch that in the Wilson Reservoir? I don't want it. Crooked River? No, no. It's, I know there's issues there. Right? How many people here, when you sit down, think when you took that Hershey kiss, where did that Hershey kiss come from? Should you have to think that? We have a constitutionally protected treaty right to hunt, fish, and trap with no forced interference. And we can't just go and catch a fish anymore and say, here, enjoy this. We have to have all these things, worries on it. The perception of risk is equal to actual risk in the context of violating the promise of the treaty. That's kind of what that means, you know. Is there a risk? Should we hunt it? Should we fish there? Where else can we fish? Well, let's go over here. Well, there's coal mines over there. We can't go over there. Well, how about over here? Well, they're fracking gas over there, and they're fracturing the ground, and there's, there's water issues of leakages and stuff like that. Trend analysis, cumulative impact, uh, cumulative effects. Trend analysis, this is for the students and all the scientists and teachers and stuff. This would make sense to you, I hope. <laughs> Mode of life. Traditionally, what do we do? We net, we fish. This is an image of, th this is the same kid. This is the kid before residential schools. And this is a kid after he went into residential schools. 
no issues with Mercury in the baseline information that when we started. Introduction of this. Now we're having to go to overweighting in Safeway. We don't have, yeah, we do have overweight up in Fort St. John. But we have to buy packaged fish. But now everyone's saying, is that wild sockeye salmon or is that Atlantic farm fish salmon? <laughs> like, where does it stop? And is this fair? I, a lot of people are watching the news. The forces of no. Where are the forces of no? Right? <laughs> like, just trying to protect who we are. Forces of no? We're not saying no to Site C. We're saying no to destroying that valley. Let's do something better. They know there's... Geothermal is a 100% viable option here in BC. We would be a w quickly a world leader if we did geothermal here. They are pumping gas out of the ground, trying to build pipelines to ship it overseas so that they can burn it into uh, gas-fired power plants over there. Why can't we do it here? If we're touting it to be clean burning fuel, why aren't we doing it here? Why do we have to destroy a valley in order to do that? Wind, solar, so talking about us, us poor Indians getting hammered on, well, ta-da, it's not just our problem, we're not the only ones out there fishing, right, surprise, this is a local resident from Hudson's Hope, she's giving me permission to use her picture, um, caught a fish. Now this is out of the Peace River, uh, below the dam. They've done some studies below the dam, but they're now proposing to flood that area where she caught that fish. The next time she goes fishing, if they flood that valley, I are we going to have to run a test on that fish? She's got three kids, or two kids, I think. Young little, little ones. She's definitely childbearing age. Do you think she sat down and considered uh, that? when they eat that fish. Their family goes up the Williamson Reservoir and goes fishing in one of those rivers that I put in there. And they do exactly the same thing we do. Sit down and fish. Catch that fish. Throw it on the fire. Crack open a beer. Talk about stories. Things like that. Not one sign up there. I think, we think, that they should be putting signs up, telling everybody that there's issues. These are health issues, serious health issues. We don't know what the long-term effects of low and level, low level ingestions of mercury is up there. There should be an awareness program, not just that little thing in the hunting synopsis. Still to date, my nation has never received a warning on Mercury. List all the rivers, creeks, lakes within the danger zone. What is the danger zone? That's what my question is. Well, where <laughs> the hell, where can we go here? Long-term action plan, monitoring. Uh, there needs to be somebody that's independent of BC Hydro to uh, do an oversight on this. Um, education and awareness programs. Nobody in Hudson's Hope knows about this stuff. I've got friends, like friends of mine that live in Husband's Hope, that go fishing, smoke the fish. That's another one. What happens when you smoke the fish up there? They smoke fish and they give it around, they give it to their grandparents and they're, and, you know, send it back east to people back there, you know. Are we spreading this around? Fund the TEK science based stuff, our stuff. We can't get funding. Because it doesn't fit within the criteria of what BC Hydro's uh, funding envelope is for this thing, right? That was set up to help us with the effects of Willis and Reservoir. But we can't access it for this kind of work because they don't do studies on, hum on the, on the uh, effects of people, human health assessments. They only look at the science of, of what's in the water, what's in the soil um, up there. 
big thank you. McCall Dwight was a big part of this. Another group of people with big smiles on their face. Uh, you know, they were instrumental. We partnered on this study with them. And, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're Treaty 8 members too, and they fish. I think that's it, guys. Thank you. Ujo, signing off. I have no idea. Am I over time? <laughs> okay, I'm good. there and I'm sure we have some questions. I'll walk around to the mic so if there are people <coughs> online they can hear the question. Um, so who wants to lead off if anyone? Oh, before I put this there for a reason. This is the amount about the amount of what I should eat a week as compared to the four that women should eat. Oh, I've dumbfounded everybody. Questions? Comments? Hi, thank you very much for the very interesting presentation and the really hot topic, I think. And I think you've captured this room and the audience and hopefully you can share with us what you would, um, what questions you would like to have answered now. Maybe some people in the room can help you and your community. Um, but my question, <laughs> you probably have multiple, but um, my question was, do you know how much time the bull trout in the Crooked River, um, how much time they spend in the Crooked versus in the lake, or how much they no. move between and where they feed? We don't know that. That's part of some of the more studies that we have to do. Um, you, you have to remember, we were sitting around a campfire when this came up just a couple years ago, and we, we applied for the funding. We caught the fish that we would normally catch and we tested them. So we haven't gone that far. We don't even know where these fish come from. Downstream is the Wilson Reservoir and there's a mercury issue there and we know that the fish migrate quite a ways. Um, bull trout and Dolly Varden move lots. So we don't know if they came from up the Parsons River, if they came from up the Finley River, or if they were from somewhere local. Um, there is one, one of the issues that was in here on one of the slides, northern pike minnow, um, from what we understand, don't move that much. Right? So that causes a question like what's, is there something naturally occurring or, or, or what, what it is, right? So we need to do more studies and find out, get more clear understanding of what it is. But what's for sure is that the mercury level isn't going down, <coughs> it's going up in the fish. Now, where is that coming from? We don't know on it. But we do know that the Crooked River where our fish camp is is only 40, 50 kilometers from the Wilson Reservoir. And that's well within the distance of where the where the, the bull trout and Dolly Varden come from. So Thank you. There was a lady right there behind you. Thank you. I remember seeing you holding a dead fish on the lawn of the legislature last spring and I didn't quite understand what that was all about but <laughs> now I do so thank you this was very informative. Uh, I'm wondering was this issue of fish contamination considered at all in the Site C Dam review process and if it wasn't are any of the current court challenges that have been launched against the Site C Dam dealing with that issue? It w we raised it. Uh, quite extensively uh, that our our report I believe is in went into the JRP right the joint review panel no. it didn't this is Bruce he's been trying to hide <laughs> <laughs> they concluded that the information that they had to do the risk assessment uh, for the communities that potentially be affected by um, consuming fish out of the reservoir wasn't reliable. So the data the BC Hydro, BC Hydro had was not reliable. Subsequent to the approval, West Moby submitted this report to British Columbia outlining this is new information um, uh, trying to address the data gap. And British Columbia, that was eight months ago, didn't respond and then approved all the other permits. So the information was provided afterwards and still no response, even though 
um, the data gap was identified. And then this helps fill it. And we're trying to get a response from them, and that's part of another court case on the permits themselves. Um, the community submitted a 45-page letter, and it was, I think the response was a page. And this document and a lot of questions with it was part of that. Thanks, Chief Wilson, for that great presentation, um, and uh, hugely appreciative of the, the stories that you've shared today. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering, we've been hearing a lot in the media about uh, a push for a renewed relationship with First Nations across Canada, uh, and we've been hearing a lot, particularly at the federal level, about improving consultation with First Peoples on a variety of different resource uh, development activities. And I'm thinking about the Silkatine decision, I'm thinking about past court cases from West Moverly uh, on the issue of public consultation. Uh, I'm wondering um, what your reflections are on that and whether you think that some of these changes will influence you know, Im or Im improve consultation on things like Site C with West Moverly. Right. Um, good question. Uh, actions speak louder than words, I would say. Um, lots of talk. I was a part of the Kelowna Accord that happened down in, in Kelowna uh, with uh, then just formering uh, Paul Martin, uh, just as he was stepping out of office and Harper was stepping in. Um, and Gordon Campbell, the uh, Premier uh, of British Columbia, participated heavily in that, and it was him that was named the new relationship. This is the new relationship for BC. Uh, how many years ago was that? Uh, now it's the new enhanced relationship with Christy <laughs> Clark. Right? Nothing's happened. They want to sit, and they'll sit and talk and talk and talk and talk and keep talking, and, and they'll talk about anything you want to talk about. But when it comes to doing stuff, they don't. I am hopeful that with the new Liberal government and Justin Trudeau, that there may be some weight behind him. He spent time living in the Haida Nations and, and knows some of the issues. Um, Justice Minister Judy Raybolt Wilson was the BC Regional Chief. You know, um, I'm hoping they'll favor us, but you know they got to be fair. But the problem is, is, is what's happening is not fair right now. Um, the decision to move Site C forward is nothing more than a political decision so that she can get reelected for the next go round. Her LNG dreams are fading away on her really fast. We're in the worst state of recession that we've ever been in. I, I would say this beats the 1980 recession that we hit. You know, and, and we're suffering. You know, we worked on these mines. When these mines shut down, all of our guys went home, right? So we're, we've got piece of equipment sitting around so we're we're involved in this as much as everybody else and that's one of the one of the things that we we're not saying no we're saying not this there's a better way let's do this let's do a geothermal plant let's make Canada a, a leader in this let's make BC front runner in new alternative energies but she's got her mind set on 100 year old archaic technology flooding rivers you know, and the new court cases, um, I haven't seen them, but they're supposed to be revamping, uh, come out already with uh, changes to the Environmental Assessment Act. I don't know how they, they are working. Um, our saving grace right now is they haven't issued any federal permits on Site C, and we're hoping that they won't. But Christy Clark is over there pounding on his door, right? <laughs> I'll be over there pounding on his door here soon, too. But, uh, you know, like, who, kn I, who knows? They didn't do a justification. That's one of our main arguments in the, in, in the federal court. They have to do what's called a sparrow justification. They can't just say, I want to do this and go and do it. They have to say, if they say, I want to do this, they have to ask the question, is this going to infringe on First Nations people? And if it's going to infringe, what is it going to infringe? Well, Site C is going to infringe constitutionally protected treaty rights. And they, they admitted, the cabinet admitted, they did not ask that question. They didn't put their minds to it. They said they didn't need to. Well, we say you have to. It's part of the Constitution of Canada. You can't make a decision of this magnitude. It's the largest project in Canadian history. Right? It's the most expensive project in Canadian history. You can't make a decision like that with such a level of impact 
and not put your mind to whether or not this is going to finish the treaty. It's like long-winded. Thank you for an interesting talk. Um, the current court case um, of the Treaty 8 Nations uh, that's being heard right now, um, if there was a positive outcome to that particular case, um, how would you see that impacting your ability to exercise rights over Site C? Would, would you see that there's a change if there's a positive I outcome for you? If it was positive for us, I w we would retain the Mobley ri uh, the the Peace River, what's left of it on that. I would hope that we would sit down immediately and engage with the federal government and the provincial government on an alternative plan, right? Um, we're not saying no, we're saying something else. Um, I, I have been approached by many people that told me geothermal is 100% feasible up there. And I think, I think this province could handle two gas-fired power plants. You know, they, everyone's worried about the greenhouse gas effects of burning gas. Nobody's talking about the production of the gas. There is enormous amounts of greenhouse gas happening with the production of shale gas. They have uh, fire stacks, uh, their compressor stations, all those things are emitting greenhouse gas. You fly up at night into Fort St. John territory and just look out the window of the plane. The whole area is lit up with fire stacks burning constantly, 24 hours a day. The development of the rigs and the trucks running those programs out there, these are massive programs. They're running 24 hours a day. Nobody's talking about that stuff. Everyone's worried about one greenhouse gas effects. Well, if you don't want greenhouse gas effects, turn your goddamn lights off, right? We wouldn't have to do this. But that's a bit of a fallacy because none of this power is going to go to a light. All this power is going to go to LNG and coal mines it's all proposed for greenhouse gas emission industries. Thank you. Thank you. Am I answering you guys' questions? Am I? Okay. Any last questions? Well, I'm sure you'd be pleased if people want to just chat with you briefly sure. afterwards. And I uh, really appreciate you coming Take and talking to us. Take those damn Hershey kisses. Take a Hershey kiss. <laughs> I remember sitting beside the Crooker River and watching a, a pair of otters, and I just sat and watched them for about half an hour, and they must have eaten like 40 or 50 fish. Yeah, I well, there's a point. After I see your graph, I sort of wonder about otter health. If, if you go to the WAC Bennett Dam um, and go down to where they do the, the uh, tours, they take you down right to the tail race there, there is an enormous amount of bald eagles and golden eagles that hover right there. And you think, well, what are they doing here? Well, there's an enormous amount of fish that come through the, the, the dam and get chewed up, and it chums the river, and those fish sit there and they eat that. And if those fish have mercury in them, then that fish goes into the eagles, and mercury is bioaccumulable. You eat one, you get that, and you eat another one, you get that, and it adds up inside you. And if somebody eats me, they get all mine. So I said, don't eat me. <laughs> <laughs> but what else is being affected? Definitely. Okay. We have a, a guest speaker coming in the latter part of uh, March, Dr. Karen Kidd from the University of New Brunswick. It's a talk on mercury accumulation and aquatic food chains. I, I should have written the date down, but I'll, I'll, I'll forward you the yeah. dates and there, or keep an eye on your, your email and the, the notices around campus so we will have a further discussion on the, the science of mercury accumulation. Thank you all for coming. Uh, have a good weekend. Uh, if we could, a round of uh, thanks to our speaker. Thank you.